Have you been considering the option of outsourcing your writing? Do you want deeper insights from a proven expert in the field of freelance writing? Then you're going to love my interview today with best-selling author, serial entrepreneur, and close friend of mine, Tim Knox. He shares why he prefers freelance writing versus self-publishing his work, why earnings can be lucrative, and what to look for when hiring a freelance writer. To hear more from Tim Knox, stick around. Welcome to Self Publishing with Dale. And if you're new to this channel and you want to learn how to publish and profit the right way, then subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to get the notifications on all my latest videos. Today's video is going to be a killer episode and only the first of a two part series. The second part is when my guest flips the script and it interviews me on a variety of topics such as starting and self publishing, being passionate, and much more. My guest today is Tim Knox, a serial entrepreneur, best-selling author, syndicated newspaper columnist, comedian, speaker, talk radio, and TV host. Tim has appeared in Reader's Digest, USA Today, CBS News, New York Times, among dozens of other reputable sites. He's carved out an amazing legacy as an entrepreneur and continues to share his open thoughts on his personal YouTube channel and featured show with Steve Gamlin and Professor Nez called The Digital Entrepreneur Show. Rather than rattle off all the other things Tim has done or is doing, let's jump right into things. Welcome to Self Publishing with Dale L. Roberts and today, man, I've got a very cool, unique, fun guest today. I I got Tim Knox, the illustrious Dude. Tim Knox. I, I thought you were introducing somebody else. Yeah, you were like, oh, <laughs> uh, is somebody else coming to the show? <laughs> who's, who's here? Dude, what's shaking in your world, man? How you feeling? You know, I'm feeling good, feeling good. Summertime here in Alabama, 185 degrees. The sun's out, the birds are singing, and I'm just rolling along. How about you? Man, I just realized that, you know, I got an image to keep and I, I forgot to switch out my glasses. See, do you do this for your videos? You have to have specific glasses you have to wear for them? You know, I have, I have like these and then I have these, which someone, <laughs> called me, someone called me Harry Potter the other day, so I don't wear these on camera anymore. And yeah, I actually, I, I don't wear glasses, I wear readers. And so behind okay. these books here, I have like 15 different pair of readers. And that used to be my thing in the video. As I would talk, I would put on different glasses and it got to the point of distraction. So now I just kind of go with these because they're not as obnoxious as the Harry Potter glasses. I, you know what? We're going to have to hit stop because I want you to put them back on. Uh, <laughs> completely unreasonable. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Much better. Much better. This this interview is going to be way better now. You've got the the Harry Potters on. So now you, want, we can really you, talk. you want the Harry Potter because my IQ does go up nominally when I wear these glasses. I, I give somewhere between no shit and zero shit. Somewhere about there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, here we go. I, I know something's coming. Let's, let's talk here about, these are the ones that make me look really smart. Hold on. <laughs> Pretty good, right? But I make that face. It's way better with the face. Way better and with the face. And of course, uh, you know who King Human is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There you yeah. go. Oh, oh, no, no. King no. Human with hair. It, it, it just like, doesn't work for you, man. <laughs> I like Prince. Right, one more, and then we'll actually get to work here. Ready? These are bifocals, and I have to do this or I can't. Those see. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, do the yeah. interview the rest of the way this way. Yeah, so anyway, uh, yeah, you, you, can, you can pick, but I'll, I'll take these. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and stick with that. So, <laughs> man, we're going to probably rabbit trail quite a bit. Are we I done? Definitely... Can I go? Yeah, this is it. We're, wow, we're finished. Quick. People are going to – they've already got a good idea. Uh, so, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, man. Give us just a brief, you know, Reader's Digest version. Sure. Ten when, knots. When, I'm, uh, when I'm not working as a, uh, a cheap sunglass model, uh, 
A serial entrepreneur, spent uh, about 30 years in the software business, semi-retired, uh, write books, publish. Right now, I make uh, most of my time is spent uh, as, a, uh, as a book editor and a ghost writer. I kind of got tired of writing my own stuff, so now I work with other authors, helping them craft their books, uh, get agents, get published, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm still in the, the publishing game, so to speak, but I'm not doing so much writing on my own anymore as much uh, editing and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my background, software, entrepreneurship, uh, taught entrepreneurship for many years, wrote a best-selling book, uh, and that picture, I look like I'm 12, but that was actually about 10 years ago. And, wow. uh, yeah, so that's it. I'm a, I'm a writer, an editor, and a, uh, a glass, uh, eyeglass model. That's tremendous, man. I, so uh, let's backtrack just a little bit. You were talking about <laughs> writing your own content and then writing content for other people. What, yeah. Which do you prefer doing? You know, I got to tell you, I would much rather prefer to write my own stuff, but I really yeah. enjoy getting paid to write for others. And that's really what got me into ghostwriting is, uh, you know, I had written my own books, novels, business books for years. And, and you know this, I mean, it's all about the marketing and that sort of thing. And I, I'm just a writer. So I found that I could actually make more money uh, ghostwriting and editing for other people and not have to worry about the marketing. Uh, and so that's what I did. I started this business, uh, I guess, about a year ago, year and a half. And I am booked out through the end of the year with, with projects. And uh, that's a nice thing. I don't care if the book sells or not. I, did, I get paid for writing it up front. So uh, do, would I rather be selling and getting rich off my own books? Sure. But yeah. am I enjoy, uh, do I enjoy eating and paying the rent? And uh, yeah, that stuff is nice too. So you mean you pay for your rent? Well, my wife does. I'm a kept man. Jesus, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, awesome, man. Well, yeah. that makes sense. I always just kind of wondered, uh, I interviewed uh, another freelance writer and her answer was, and this was on another podcast that I did this, mm -hmm. her answer was, it's just, you know, ready ready-made cash, you know, pretty yeah. much. I do the project. I'm done with it. I don't need to worry about anything else. Yeah. I guess to me, I get too attached to some of my work that I become so invested in it. And then someone, you know, goes out and, you know, puts poop on the cover. And well, like, see, that's, you go. That's, that's the thing. You really have to put the ego aside mm -hmm. because I mean, I'm, you know, all this goofiness aside, I'm, I'm a really serious writer. And if you look at the statistics, 99% of writers uh, make less than $5,000 a year. And those are the ones that actually can sell anything. Oh my gosh. And yeah. So, you know, for every Stephen King or every John Grisham, there are several million other writers who a lot of them can write just as well. They just, uh, they're, they're not selling either place, time, whatever. And so it really comes down to ego. It's kind of like I, I had one person wow who was really giving me a hard time because I was working as a ghostwriter and they said, well, do doesn't it bother you when they take your work and they do the marketing and they put a different name on it? And I'm like, it would only bother me if the check didn't clear, you know? So <laughs> I'm, I, I, that's it. I'm, I'm a professional ghostwriter and I've written every kind of fiction you can imagine from young adults. I've even written some romance, believe it or not. Uh, and you know, it pays incredibly well I will I'll do six figures this year ghostwriting for other people mm -hmm. and I probably won't make six dollars on my own book so it wow. really comes down to 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 the ego and that sort of thing of course the people Dale that are giving me crap about ghostwriting are the ones that are going to a nine-to-five job every week while I'm here in my mm. house in my underwear uh, tapping on a keyboard so I'm glad to know that you at least put on a shirt. I have no idea what you're wearing down below there. We, not wearing, just, you want me to show? I'm not wearing any pants. Yeah, it's, let's leave the mystery there. I, I want uh, people's <laughs> imagination to run wild right Ooh, now. Scary thoughts. You know, uh, probably about a few years ago, I'd actually just, I'd always heard of ghostwriting, but I guess mm -hmm. I wasn't aware that it was so prevalent within the publishing community. Yeah. Um, but I mean, what is, what's the big hang up? Because I know when I heard, first heard that, I, immediately I'm thinking, well, that's unethical. Oh, yeah, I, I got that as well. Well, that's, that's immoral. That you shouldn't, well, you know, every ghostwriting has been around since the dawn of time. The, the most popular ghostwritten book is the Bible. 
And, you know, you go into a bookstore, you look at, look at any Donald Trump book, look at uh, books written by celebrities, look at uh, most of those, uh, even now fiction to a great degree. Uh, a lot of James Patterson's books are ghost written, even though they have his name on them. So um, a I don't know why that is. I've had people say, well, that's just immoral. You shouldn't. And I'm like, you know, I'm getting paid to write. They own the work. They can put their pen name on it. They can go sell it. And that's another thing a lot of people don't think of. They see, think if they see a book in a bookstore, the person whose name is on that book and whose picture is on that flap is actually the person who wrote it. In a lot of cases, that's not the case. Yeah. So, you know, anyone thinking that that's, that's immoral, um, you know, if you hire someone to cut your grass, it is the exact same thing. You are hiring someone to perform a, perform a service or deliver a project or a product and you're paying them to do so. So, you know, it would only be immoral if you ghost wrote uh, books and you published under someone else's name that wasn't yours. Like if I wrote a book and mm -hmm. tried to pass that off as a John Grisham book, that would be illegal. That would be immoral. And, and I would never do that. Yeah. But hiring me to write a 60,000 word young adult mystery is no different than hiring me to write a five page brochure for your business. It's exactly the same thing. So, you know, people who have that moral high ground issue with something as simple as ghostwriting just really yeah. don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah. And I think that was where I was at when I came into this because I, you know, I've been a writer all my life. It wasn't until mm -hmm. a few years ago that I decided, Hey, let's go ahead and start making a living from this. Yeah. And then when I heard that, it was funny. My wife actually had introduced me to the actual concept. I remember I'm like, that's not right. But then it was like, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the Robert Kiyosaki's of the world, the, um, uh, Give me some other ones that are go well, ghost written. Right, here, here's the, uh, any wrestler. There we go. <laughs> well, you mentioned Ki Kiyosaki. He he did not write Rich Dad Poor Dad. Nope. It not was too many people by, realize I, that. I don't remember the 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 lady's name. I think you know Rich Dad Poor Dad was written. I think she was his accountant or something. But it was actually written as a marketing piece for a game that Kiyosaki invented. What the cash flow game? I think it's called. It's actually quite fun too. It's like a different version of Monopoly. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I always go broke in that game. I'm not sure why um but you know the the written not only was the rich dad poor dad a ghost written book the story's not even true it's it's based on people that kiyosaki knew but did all of that stuff really happen no probably not did he write those books no probably not and you know you look at some of the books of uh, some of the most popular, well-known people, especially in uh, motivational, you know, like I said, celebrity, that sort of thing, uh, those books are written by other people. There's a very well-known author who, and I'm not going to mention his name because he is a friend of mine who wrote probably one of the top-selling uh, business books of all time, originally published in the late 70s, I believe. Wow. And he wrote the first book. Since then, there have probably been a couple of dozen variations on that first book written by other people who literally paid him a large sum of money just to put his name on the book as their co-author. So is, is that immoral? No. I mean, that's taking advantage of the notoriety. James Patterson is the same way. You know, James Patterson, probably one of the top two or three fiction authors of all time, 60, 70 million books. Very rarely does James Patterson write an entire book by himself anymore. He has partners who will pitch him the idea, write the story. He may read it or do an edit, but, you know, he's, he's not. And, and why should he? You know, he's at a point in his career when he can let someone else do the heavy lifting and, and uh, use his name. So, did, can you tell you got me off on a rant there? I need yeah, to take a pill. It's A-OK, -okay, uh, but, you know, <laughs> work, work smarter, not harder. So many people think exactly. that hustle means that you've got to freaking stay up till 7 a.m. every day and sleep for right. two hours and jump right back into it. And that's just not entirely true. You just got to be smart about what you do. And yeah. You know, uh, it, it's just crazy to think, okay, so I've got a question for you. If I'm a self-publisher who can't write worth a darn, okay, I hire out Tim Knox to do some work for me. How do I present my content to the reading audience, to my buyers? Because obviously, um, I can't use your face. 
Right. Um, and I can't use, I mean, let's say I don't want to use my own face. Well, I, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, here's, here's how it, it typically works. You know, there are a lot of different moving parts to books. There's not just a writer who writes a book mm -hmm. and ships it off to a publisher who publishes a book, especially yeah. if you're doing everything yourself. So there is... Uh, the conceptualization of the idea. Before that, there's even the research. Okay, what am I going to write about? What market am I going to sell to? Is it going to be romance? Is it going to be young adult? Am I going to do nonfiction? You, you really have to approach it like a business, and you better than anyone knows this. So when a client comes to me and says, uh, you know, I, I have done the, the research, and I think the, the young adult mystery market is very hot right now. I want to hire you to write a uh, and this was an actual uh, story, an 80,000 word young adult mystery. And so in the meeting we had initially, he kind of outlined his thoughts and ideas and really just kind of gave me a main character and kind of an overall premise. And then I took that and worked out the plot. I created an outline. I presented the outline back to him. I included some, I'm, I'm really thorough. I included character profiles. Uh, right. Once he approved that and paid 50% of my fee, I, I started writing. And I think it, I, I probably worked on that book a couple of months because it was 80,000 words and I had other stuff going on. So when it was finished, I did a, I, I also do the editing. I, I'm not only a writer, I do the editing. So I went back through, edited, uh, created the final draft and presented it to him. And, and he paid me the rest of my money. And at that point, the book, the work was his. Mm -hmm. My name was nowhere on it. I maintained no ownership in the work whatsoever. I was paid for a service. I completed that service, gave him the book. Now, he did not want to put his name on it either. He actually published a number of different genres, and he did them all with pen names. And, you know, if you don't know what a pen name is, <laughs> Christ, look it up. Uh, a pen name is a, a nom de plume, a, a fictitious name that an author or a publisher will use in place of their own. So what he did was he uh, came up with a pen name. He had the book designed. He didn't put his picture on the book at all. There was no image of the author on the book. Oh. There was a really quick, brief bio like, you know, uh, Boris Yeltsin is from Czechoslovakia where he lives with his wife and four kids or whatever. And he published the book under that pen name. And it wasn't Boris Yeltsin. That's an old Russian politician. <laughs> he used that name for some reason. Um, but then he published the book and then he actually took it a step farther and hired someone to actually market the book for him. So if you look at all the pieces, you've got, you know, the, the, the conceptualization, you've got the creation of the, the outline of the overall synopsis, you've got the writing of the book, you've got the editing of the book, you've got the final draft of the book submitted to the owner who has a cover done, comes up with a title, comes up with a pen name, puts it on Amazon and hires someone to market the work. So there's a, there are a lot of people involved in that process. Now, you know this, some people do all that themselves. And it's exhausting. I used to do that, Dale. I was yeah. a, a, a KDP publisher. I had 300 books on Amazon at one time. And I was juggling ghost writers and cover designers and trying to work out an ARC team. And it was just really overwhelming. But some people do it very well. Uh, most of those people are not the writers, though. They're really just the, the ones that have the work written and then they market it. Because as you know, marketing is the key. Absolutely. You can, write, you can write the greatest book ever written, but if you cannot market it, nobody's ever going to read it, period. Trust yeah. me, I know I've written those books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no doubt, man. And I, I imagine probably part of the reason why your hair turned gray was because you did all of that work. This is white. It's not gray. It's white. Excuse me. Uh, I stand corrected. Um, it's just, but it's the lighting. You're, you're getting hey, let, some me, good... let, me, uh, let me see your hair, Dale. <sighs> yeah, that's he's got jokes, everybody. You know, it's funny. Some people will be like, what are you, a comedian? W what's your answer typically? <laughs> like, yeah. No, I'm, I'm just an asshole. <laughs> awesome stuff, man. Dude, you're dropping some good 411, man. Especially, this is something I haven't covered too much into my uh, channel is ghostwriting and getting all this stuff done. If a person was to approach a good writer such as yourself, 
what can they anticipate on investing? What's going to be the type of investing? What's the services that you offer? And I'm sure each one of them are broken down into different price points. Well, th they are. And you know, <clears throat> what, what I do in my, my business, Knox Media, is um, I'll, I'll do what we've talked about already. I'll, I'll sit down with the client. I'll, you know, they can just give me a, a genre and I'll take it all from there. I'll do the, the conceptualization. I'll do the, you know, the, the character profiles, all of that stuff. And, you know, for, for writing a book, it's going to run anywhere uh, from, gosh, it depends on the book, but you're going to go anywhere for a really good ghost, a real ghost writer and not yeah. someone sitting in the Philippines that you found on Upwork who'll, who'll do it for a hundred book, bucks for 10,000 words or whatever. Uh, a real ghost writer, you're going to pay anywhere from 10 cents a word as high as 50 cents a word. I mean, you yeah. can literally spend you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars on getting a book published, but on the lower end, you know, if uh, an eighty thousand word book at, uh, you know, six cents a word, that's forty eight hundred dollars just for the the book. So it really depends on uh, your budget, your needs, what you anticipate doing. Yeah. You know, various editing services are charged by the word, and um, you know, I, I actually I think the the rates are on my my website uh, and I'll, I'll give you that link I think it's findabookeditor.com is okay. the main site and uh, you know and that's why a lot of people get sticker shock when they come to me and want me to write a book for a penny a word and I'm like you're out of your freaking mind I'm not gonna I can't do that it's just you know a penny um, per word. I, I mean, what, well, what, I mean, like 1960s wants your, your cost here back. Well, here, here's <laughs> the thing. You had all of these people who started, you know, getting into Kindle publishing a couple of years ago, doing nonfiction, doing romance. Uh, they would go to Upwork and they would post a job for a penny a word. You know, I want a 10,000 word story and I'm willing to pay you a hundred bucks. Well, as you well know, 99% of the writers on Upwork are not writers. Half of them don't even speak good English. And you, you basically get what you pay for. So a lot yeah. of people, they, they watch the YouTube videos and they hear these experts talking about, you know, paying <laughs> one to two cents a word. And uh, yeah, you get what you pay for. So you know, again, with, with someone like me, my, my average price per word is 10 to 15 cents a word. Mm -hmm. uh, but that includes everything that I talked about as well as editing. Now, if someone comes to me and they just, let's say they have a, an 80,000 word fiction book that they've written and they want it edited, uh, you know, there are different kinds of editing. There's copy editing where you just go through and correct spelling and punctuation. There's developmental editing where you go through and you look at things like grammar, structure. Uh, there's a rewrite editing and, and everyone is more difficult than the, than the next. And that sort of thing will run you anywhere from 1500 bucks to 6000 bucks, depending on what you need. So, you know, it, it really depends on how serious the author is about getting their book perfect. And, and, and it comes down to budget. You know, you got mm -hmm. to remember as well, most, uh, I, I talk to a lot of people who are, you know, they're, they're working day jobs, they're living paycheck to paycheck. They wrote a book because they felt they, you know, it's one of those, well, I had the book inside me and I had to get it out. And I always tell them to watch the movie Alien about that, you know. Um, so... Uh, a lot of people can't afford that sort of thing, but you know, again, it comes back to to your intent. Is this something you're going to try to do on your own? Are you going to try to get an agent and a traditional publisher? If you're going in that direction, your book has to be really a much higher quality than it would be if you're just going to self-publish it yourself. Yeah, uh, but you know, don't don't. I know of books that just were crap that were self-published and somehow caught an audience and now are doing, you know, the, the authors are doing six figures a year publishing books full of typos. So a lot of it depends on the audience you're serving and, and what they will tolerate and what they won't. But, you know, when, when I do it, I'm, I'm a professional editor ghostwriter. It's going to be as good as it can be. Nice. Um, we're, we're starting to get towards the end. I want to ask like one more loaded question before we wrap up things. Um, if, you are a newbie self-publisher, knowing the things that you know now. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the first few steps that you would do? Am I writing for my, my own books or am I just looking to sell books that someone else writes? Either one of them. Let's okay. say you're brand new. I want you to choose a path. 
Well, you know, it, it really doesn't matter because it, it, it kind of starts the same and it's exactly the same advice I give my, my business students. You know, I've been teaching business classes for 10 years and you always start off with your audience, your customer. You know, before you create a product or write a book or do anything, you've got to figure out, okay, who am I going to sell this to? And I, I have so many of these authors who tell me, well, I'm, I'm writing, you know, because I have to. I don't care if anyone ever reads it. Well, good. Because nobody ever will. But if you're serious about earning a living either as a, a, a writer yourself or a publisher of other one, people's writings, you have to start off with the, with the customer in mind. You have to do your research, get on Amazon, look at the various genres. If you're thinking about doing uh, romance, you know, there are a hundred sub-genres of romance. You should go in and look at all of those. If you're looking at self-help or for the love of God, essential oils or whatever, uh, you want to do your research to make sure that there is a market there. And then you look at what's selling there. Okay, I'm going to go look at the top five or 10 books and just see what's, what's selling. What are people buying? What are people reading? And basically, I do this because I need to get a gauge of the saleability or marketability of my own product before I spend the time to create it. So that's the first thing I would do. If, I've, if you've got an idea, uh, you know, get over in that genre and do the research and then look at what's out there and then create your plan of attack from there. If you are just looking for the hot market, what are you going to do? There's, there's a wall. Throw some spaghetti at it. But whatever you come up with, uh, you know, go check it out. I always encourage people, Dale, to, to write or publish in, an, in a genre or an area that they like because – you know, when I, I, again, had 300 books on uh, Amazon, a number of those were in a genre that I just didn't really like. You know, I, my heart just wasn't in it. So I didn't market those books as well. And I, I ended up losing money on several of those books because I, got, I had them produced and I went, nah, who gives a crap? So yeah. make sure you like what you're producing and, and approach it as a business. Because if you don't, it's going to be a hobby and you're not going to make any money. Yeah, we all know you still love Werebear, Wolf, shapeshifter, rabbit, uh, love, I'll tell you what, interest, romance. A good, alpha, a good alpha male dinosaur billionaire triplet romance cranks <laughs> my track. And people probably think we're joking. It exists. <laughs> I, you know what? The, the ones that really get me, honestly, are the dinosaur romances where the girl falls in love with the T-Rex. <laughs> I'm, you know, how do you I'm, make out with a t-rex anyways i mean you know their arms are like this you know yeah but yeah seriously they're out there you remember when you used to do the bad covers which was my favorite thing ever <laughs> it's coming doing, back <laughs> i love those damn things and i think one of them i think you actually did a dinosaur porno romance once that i just loved uh, yeah, it's, it's very possible. But yeah, Clapper Crap will be making its resurgence soon enough because I have a, at least about two to three dozen other covers I have yet to touch. Buddy, I would contribute $5 a month to your Patreon account if you will do the crappy covers again. Oh, it's, it's always a pleasure. And I'm sure one of these times some people are going to be like, what are you going to pull up your covers? Because I have some real abortions, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, hey, Tim, man, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Uh, is there, uh, how can people reach you, man? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of everywhere. My, my main site, timnox.com, you can find links to everything I do, uh, including my, my editing and ghostwriting service. Uh, I've got a, uh, a YouTube channel, just go search for Tim Knox. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Hell, Dale, I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm like Santa Claus. I'm everywhere. Yeah, for sure. And actually, I, I do want to add something to this sure. is uh, there are a number of my videos that are coming out here that actually link over to, to some of yours. So I can definitely get behind a lot of what Tim actually shares in some of his videos. Um, it's, it's funny. Uh, at times, sometimes you're irreverent, but it's <laughs> truthful. It's great information. And that's, that's one thing I love about your channel. So yeah, definitely everybody take time, go over, take a look at YouTube. Tim, thanks. I really appreciate your time. And I imagine we're going to hang on here because um, you and I are going to be talking to me next. Wow. You know what? I, I want to flip the tables on you and uh, talk to you for my uh, digital entrepreneur show. Excellent. Sounds like an awesome man. I really appreciate your time. All right, buddy. Take care. That's all the time we have for today. But if you want to catch the second half of our interview, then head over to Tim Knox's YouTube channel and remember to subscribe. 
Now get out there and create your own self-publishing success story, you savvy self-publisher you. Till later, this has been Self-Publishing with Dale, and I'll see you guys soon.